Hi everyone, I'm Lori Weinstein, the Executive Director of Jewish Women International, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all to today's briefing. Being hosted by the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence Against Women on a topic that couldn't be more timely or urgent, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. As the leading Jewish organization working to end gender-based violence, JWI represents the voices of 50,000 members and supporters and 175 Jewish service providers from across the country. We conduct trainings for domestic violence professionals through the National Alliance to End Domestic Abuse and convene the Interfaith Domestic Violence Coalition, composed of over two dozen national faith organizations, many of whom are here today. We are also proud members of the steering committee of the National Task Force. The National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence Against Women is a large and diverse group of hundreds of national, tribal, state, territorial, and local organizations that have worked together for over a decade with one common goal, ending violence against women. Collectively, we represent thousands of programs and millions of victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking, the survivors and the professionals who serve them throughout the United States and the territories as well. And today we are here to discuss our nation's most important tool in responding to violence against women. The Violence Against Women Act, or VAWA, first passed by Congress in 1994 and due for reauthorization this year. VAWA recognizes the insidious and pervasive nature of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking, and provides resources and support for comprehensive, effective, and cost-saving responses to these crimes. The National Task Force applauds our Senate champions Chairman Patrick Leahy and Senator Michael Crapo, who have worked tirelessly to introduce S-1925, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2011, a strong bipartisan legislative initiative that will reauthorize VAWA for another five years and make critical improvements to existing programs. Their efforts mock bipartisan collaboration, and we thank them for their unwavering and continued leadership. The National Task Force made a commitment over three years ago to reach thousands of professionals in the field to learn how VAWA could better serve victims of violence. We thank Chairman Leahy and Senator Crapo for incorporating these insights and proposals into their legislation. S-1925 is truly responsive to the needs of victims, survivors, and the professionals who serve them and build upon and builds upon VAWA's successes. S-1925 includes 10 titles that support criminal, criminal justice responses and wraparound services for victims. By supporting these services like legal assistance and affordable housing, improving coordinated community-based responses to violence, and addressing the unique needs of victims in different communities, this legislation will help victims continue to move from crisis to stability. I would also like to note that this bill is moving very quickly and will be marked up by the Senate Judiciary Committee next Thursday, February 2nd. And the reauthorization of VAWA could not come at a more critical time. According to the CDC's 2010 National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, one in four women have been the victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner, and nearly one in five women have been raped in their lifetime. Although VAWA has transformed our nation's response to violent crimes against women, increasing the reporting of domestic violence by as much as 51%, while reducing the number of women killed by intimate partners by as much as 34%. More must be done and can be done to combat this epidemic. S-1925 must be passed by this Congress to ensure a continued and improved federal response to these crimes. 
In today's briefing, you will hear from some of the leading national, state, and local experts about the positive impact of VAWA in their communities and the urgent need for reauthorization. In the interest of time, I will introduce all of the panelists now, as well as Terry Poor, who will facilitate the question and answer session and close the briefing. We hope that you'll leave today's briefing with a full understanding of the scope of VAWA's programs and services, and that you'll also have the tools to be an effective advocate for this legislation in your Senate offices. And now to our distinguished panelists. Our first speaker, Cindy Dyer, is the Vice President for Human Rights at Vital Voices Global Partnership. Prior to this, Cindy served as the Director of the United States Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women under President George W. Bush. Our second speaker, Dave Thomas, currently works as the Program Administrator of the Domestic Violence Education Program, as well as a faculty member Division of Public Safety Leadership at Johns Hopkins University. Dave retired from the Montgomery County Police Department in December of 2000 after 15 years of service. And upon retirement, he was honored to have been the second highest decorated officer in the history of the department. Following Dave, our third speaker, Ben Rusker, serves as the Executive Director of Cedar Valley Friends of the Family private, nonprofit victim advocacy agency serving victims of domestic violence and sexual assault in Bremer, Butler, and Chickasaw counties in Iowa, where he's worked for more than 10 years. Cedar Valley offers an array of services to victims and their families, including emergency shelter, crisis counseling, legal and medical advocacy, support groups, and transitional housing and then specializes in serving victims in rural communities. Chick Dabby, who is our fourth speaker, is the director of the Asian and Pacific Islander Institute on Domestic Violence, a national resource center providing training and technical assistance. With more than 30 years in the field, she's acquired expertise in domestic violence in Asian and Pacific Islander communities, violence over the life course and its influence on help seeking, trafficking, intimate homicide, language access and interpretation, child custody, and sexual violence in conflict zones. And our final speaker, Tanya Lovelace, is the project manager for the Women of Color Network, a project of the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence based in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The Resource Center supports and promotes the efforts of women of color activists in the United States and the U.S. territories to develop culturally relevant approaches that address violence against women. Tanya has served in the field of violence against women for over 17 years, holding various positions along the way, including direct service roles and system change roles that focus on the training of police, prosecutors, probation officers, judges, and victim advocates. And our facilitator, Terry Poor, has worked to end violence against women and on behalf of victims and survivors for almost 20 years as a volunteer, rape crisis counselor, victim advocate, trainer, and policy advocate. She is currently the Director of Public Affairs for the Florida Council Against Sexual Violence and policy chair of the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence. Thank you so much, and now our program will begin. I didn't belong to the courthouse. By the time I left the district attorney's office in 2007, there was no question that crimes of like these belonged in the courthouse and they needed to be treated seriously. No more did I get asked by a judge like I was in 1993. Well, Cindy, don't you and your husband fight? And when I said, well, you know, we fight, but he has never tried to hit me in the head with a claw hammer the way that the case that I was presenting him was. And he said to me, well, there are different classes of people in this world, and they take care of their problems in a different way. You better learn that. No more did I get those questions. Um, and we learned as criminal justice professionals that we needed to work closely with community-based service providers to make sure that all of the victims' many, many needs were addressed. 
Because I had witnessed the benefits of VAWA, I was particularly excited and honored when President Bush appointed me to be the director of the Office on Violence Against Women in 2007. And while working at OBW, I saw the hard work that goes on behind the scenes to ensure that the grant money is spent in the most effective and benefit-maximizing way possible. In my current job, I have the pleasure of working with countries all over the world in helping them improve their response to violence against women. And I always point to VAWA as the most significant thing that is helping victims of domestic and sexual violence, and I encourage them to imitate it as much as possible. One of the reasons for the success of VAWA and its reauthorizations is that it is specifically structured to encourage a coordinated, multidisciplinary response. There is an understanding that no one sector can do it alone. A great police report that doesn't have a willing and trained prosecutor is of no value. Successful prosecutions mean nothing if the victim ends up homeless and impoverished. And violence will never permanently end unless victims can receive legal services to obtain protective orders and a permanent end and divorce from the marriage. So because of this knowledge, VAWA recognizes that some money must be spent in each of the critical response categories. I know that much discussion has been had around accountability measures and the importance of making sure that taxpayer money is spent legally and wisely. As a prosecutor, I actually received VAWA money myself. I also received state non-VAWA money, money from private foundations, and even money from a corporation because I tried it everywhere I could get money. And I will tell you that without question, the federal OBW money that I received had the most stringent oversight rules. Um, grantees are currently have strict reporting requirements. We must we had to report every six months on detailed program activities and financial activities. Those reporting forms are very extensive. Most of them are about 35 pages long before I entered the data. Um, honestly, it was, in some respects, for a prosecutor, difficult to follow those rules and regs. But I think that that's okay. The very people that you want to receive this money, people that are providing shelter in rural areas, people um, that are arresting the bad guys on the communities, uh, on the streets of our communities, they, by definition, are not trained and experienced in the details of federal accounting procedures. Um, the solution is not to take the money away from them, but to provide them assistance in helping them document properly how the money was spent. I used to tell my OBW um, grant manager that if somebody murders your sister, you come see me and I will put him under the jail. If you need complicated accounting procedures follow, you're gonna have to give me a little bit of help. And that is exactly what the Office of Violence Against Women is doing. They recently established a grants financial management division within the, within the office of OBW to specifically administer the grants, provide technical assistance to recipients like myself, and also to provide financial grants management training to grantees. Now, there's definitely a learning curve. Um, First-year grantees have a lot more trouble, but these are huge improvements, and there are more that are coming in this um, version of VAWA. There's even more detailed reporting. There is a repeal of unfunded and ineffective programs, and there's a consolidation of overlapping programs. There is also across-the-board reductions in program budgetary authorizations. VAWA is truly a great example of the good that can come when, when there is a partnership, a true partnership between states and the federal government. There have always been requirements placed on the states in the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, the STOP program currently requires that states spend 25% for law enforcement, a certain percentage for prosecution. There is a new requirement in this, in this reauthorization that requires states to spend a minimum, a minimum amount on services for sexual assault survivors. This is in furtherance of the need to have a coordinated response that responds to the, to the needs of all victims and all victimizations. There are also other requirements in the um, in VAWA Act, which have proved hugely successful and which the Supreme Court has looked at and determined that they are good examples of making sure that money is not wasted. There's a requirement that you receive training. You must partner with a community-based nonprofit organization. Um, I really believe that these requirements, these small requirements, ensure that the states maintain the holistic, coordinated community response that victims need. 
Most of the victims that I represented in court were victims of several crimes. Most of them were victims of domestic violence and sexual violence and stalking. Very rarely was it just one or the other. I really believe that it is these small regulations which are the, which are the very reason for the attitudinal change that I mentioned earlier. These requirements result in the most profound changes because they encourage us to think holistically, to work with multi-sector partners and receive training. They also last long after the money is gone. The relationships that I made from working with my community-based nonprofits, the knowledge I learned from training, the focus on responding to all of a victim's needs and all of her victimizations, those things last even when the money is gone. And I believe that that is the greatest measure of success for a piece of legislation, and it is why I'm urging a swift reauthorization. The Violence Against Women Act has really gone a long way in helping law enforcement achieve its goal of making the law keep its promise. Crimes that once flew under the, radar, under the radar screen have been brought to light and put in their proper perspective so that victims in the community can be proper, properly protected and criminals in those same communities can be arrested and prosecuted. As we look at how far we've come and how much we've accomplished, we mustn't be so naive as to believe our work is done. The efforts born out of, out of VAWA are still in their infancy with respect to ongoing training, policy development, and procedural changes needed for law enforcement to effectively protect and serve. When I entered law enforcement in 1986, the standard operating procedure was for us to go in, separate the parties, perhaps have somebody walk around the block to leave for the night and go back into service without so much as taking a report. If there was a question of whether to lock somebody up, we put the burden on the victim. You know what? When we responded to our robberies, we never asked the bank owner, do you want the robber locked up? In 1990, I responded to a home that I'd been to a number of times before. Following our standard procedure at the time, I handled the call quickly and went back into service without so much as taking a report. But something about the call was different. Something that I couldn't really articulate kept telling me the victim was in grave danger. Less than three weeks later, we were again called to this same address. But as circumstances unfolded, this same victim was shot to death by her estranged husband in front of myself and three other uniformed officers. We responded by shooting him as he fell back into the home. The door slammed. He put the rifle under his, under his throat and blew his head off. With the passing of VAWA in 1994, as Cindy said, a sea change began. It was at this time that we began to drive home the point that the Constitution does not stop at the doorstep, that it exists in the home just as it does on the streets. It was at this time we began to remind our fellow officers of their duty to uphold the law against any and all criminals. With the passing of time and the benefit of enlightenment, these things began to change. Officers began to receive adequate training, resulting in increased arrest and reduced recidivism. Felony assaults began to decline, as did domestic violence-related homicides, because the misdemeanor crime arrests went up. These changes occurred and continue to occur due to an ongoing <coughs> effort to educate, update, analyze, fine-tune, and adjust our response. In Maryland, these efforts have included the implementation of the Lethality Assessment Protocol, where local service providers work together and collaborate with local law enforcement to save lives. In Maryland, we had an ongoing average for 25 years of 69 domestic violence-related homicides a year. One of the alarming things that I and my fellow uh, committee members came to realize when we were formulating this protocol was that, you know, in many of these cases, these victims had never been connected to services. So we figured, we're going to do that. Over the past five years, the degree of law enforcement participation statewide has changed and increased, we've seen a corresponding double-digit decrease in domestic violence-related homicides. From 56 in 2008 to 45 in 2009 to 33 in 2010 to 27 in 2011. Officers are trained to read the signs that can provide guidance and safety for all, information that I yearn for uh, when tragedy stuck struck some 21 years ago. Although seeds have been planted in 13 other states to implement like programs, this falls far short 
of what should and could be done in every state and community in this country. And when I speak of safety for all, I mean just that. We must remember that 14 law, law enforcement officers were killed last year intervening in domestics. As we move forward and search for ways to improve, we have to come to realize the vast importance of the U visa and how it fits squarely with the community policing philosophy. The U, the U visa is a valuable law enforcement tool that is available to non-citizen victims of certain crimes, including domestic violence and sexual assault, who have been or are likely to be helpful in investigating or prosecuting a crime. Community policing is about working with members of the community in a joint effort to keep communities safe. Explaining and utilizing the U visa can start a dialogue, develop a rapport, build trust, making members of the community more likely to share information. There's a dire need to address some of the most violent criminals in our communities. We're not talking about petty crimes here, like shoplifting or vandalism. We're talking about rape, murder, torture, to name a few. We must, what must be understood is that when we don't address criminal behavior in our communities, we enable criminal behavior to grow in those same communities. Understand that this class of criminal are serial in nature. They are master manipulators, and they target those who they perceive as vulnerable, accessible, and lacking in credibility, making an undocumented immigrant a prime target. Growing, growing awareness about the UZ visa certification process is enabling police departments across the country to take advantage of this tool that can help in the investigation and prosecution of serious crimes and improve public safety. Coupled with community policing strategies, the U visa strengthens the ability of law enforcement agencies to detect, investigate, prosecute, and solve cases. Additionally, it is vitally important that we increase the number of available U visas. Currently, there's a cap at 10,000 per year. For the past two years, this limit has been met before the end of the fiscal year. We need 10,000 more. To those of us in law enforcement, 10,000 more visas translates into getting 10,000 more violent criminals out of our neighborhoods. Victims who are safe and away from perpetrators and self-sustaining make excellent witnesses. Finally, we really need to have more avenues of certification and ways to qualify more agency representatives to certify. You know, 80% of the departments in this country are 10 officers or less. The key to authorized signature for certification is to have persons properly trained and accessible to the cop on the street. It must also be realized that some jurisdictions won't provide certification. With this in mind, it is important to allow for immigrant victims who have sufficient evidence of corroborating or cooperating an investigation of or prosecution of a crime to submit an application for a U visa when certification is not available in their own jurisdiction. We've seen a great deal of progress, yet there's much more work to be done to ensure that no one ends up a victim of intimate partner violence, of intimate partner suicide, and instead, victims and children can lead safe and productive lives. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for giving me the time to come up and talk to you about the Violence Against Women Act and how reauthorization is vital to local programs. As the executive director of a rural program located in Northeast Iowa, it has helped us to continue to provide the best service possible to survivors. Cedar Valley Friends and Family provides a 24 hour crisis line, 21 bed shelter, for medical and general advocacy for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. We have seen an increase in services needed over the past six months. We have already surpassed our nights of shelter from fiscal year 2010 to 2011 of 1,723 nights with over 1,900 nights since July of 2011. Cedar Valley Friends and Families provided a record amount of services only six months in this current fiscal year. The Violence Against Women Act helps us provide wraparound services to law enforcement in our area through a court advocate. We get signed contracts from local law enforcement that state they will give all victims of domestic violence and sexual assault a packet with Cedar Valley Friends and Family information. They ask the victim if they would like to talk with an advocate and get them in touch with one of our certified staff. This collaboration between programs and law enforcement helps ensure that victims are able to receive services immediately 
following a domestic or sexual violence incident. The support that VAWA provides allows this relationship to exist and flourish. Beyond the immediate relationship with local police and sheriff's departments, VAWA supports a victim witness coordinator in the county attorney's office. This position is vital for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. This gives the victim a different type of support outside of the advocate we provide. The victim witness coordinator helps with the navigation of the system and makes sure that the right people are working on behalf of the survivor. They ensure that a protection order stays in place and that anyone who is a victim of violent crime is given the necessary resources in the judicial system. This position has been a tremendous support for local law enforcement, county attorneys, victim service providers, and survivors. Without VAWA funds, this system would not be in place. I'd like to briefly tell a quick story about how this process worked in Waverly, Iowa. A woman who was held captive, beaten, and sexually assaulted by her partner was able to finally escape and was met at the hospital by an advocate. She was walked through a sexual assault exam, met by local police, and then came into shelter for safety. The abuser was arrested, and providers within, within our community worked together to build a case that resulted in the conviction of the perpetrator. With VAWA funding, we were able to provide her a court advocate, victim witness coordinator, and the ability to navigate the court system without feeling isolated and alone. I understand that at times it has been questioned as to who the VAWA program serves. I would like to make it very clear that we use funds from this program to serve anyone who is a victim, regardless of gender. Although we serve many more women than men, we do serve anyone who seeks services. Cedar Valley Friends of the Family currently has three male survivors working directly with advocates on safety planning, domestic violence counseling, and addressing services that are needed to help move them in a safe direction. We have also seen an increase in hotline calls from male survivors. It is very important that we as a program are cognizant of the needs of everyone in our service area. As a service provider, we are very excited about some enhanced parts of the legislation involved in the Reauthorization Act. I'd like to quickly point out three parts of the bill that will assist local programs. First, understanding that domestic violence homicides are often predictable and therefore preventable in many cases, the proposed legislation encourages state and local communities to screen victims for warning signs and provide immediate intervention for those at risk. Second, sexual assault is a pervasive and misunderstood crime. More than 20 million women in the U.S. have been victims of rape and less than one in six rapes are reported to the police. The proposed legislation will help improve the law enforcement response to these crimes, build strong cases that can be successfully prosecuted, and link victims with services. Last, when young people experiencing dating violence, stalking, or sexual assault, they need caring peers and adults who can intervene and provide support. The proposed legislation will help schools, youth organizations, and domestic violence agencies work more effectively with youth and engage young people in stopping violence before it starts. This will allow an organization like ours to have even stronger ties with our local school district and the local college. Reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act will allow small programs like Cedar Valley Friends of the Family to continue providing policy, quality services to survivors. In tough economic times, programs across Iowa have been forced to look at what qualifies as essential services and then think about the services we may no longer be able to provide with further cuts. As funding cuts continue to affect local programs in Iowa and less donations coming from private support, programs are asked to do the impossible and manage programs the same with less money. Without reauthorization of Iowa, more services will be lost to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Programs like CDFF already run on minimal staff and protect every dime to make sure that we can provide the best services. If local match is a required part of the reauthorization act, Services will be cut further, and shelters now will not be kept up as well, they are, as well as they are in the state of Iowa. Money that we now use to provide essential services will be diverted to making the match requirement. Programs will then be spending donated dollars to cover match, and will have to spend more time raising funds with limited resources and staff to complete this task. Local match will pull our time away from serving the survivors that are in the most need of assistance. I'm Kip Dabby. I'm the director of the Asian and Pacific Islander Institute on Domestic Violence, and I'm utterly honored to be here uh, in front of all of you. 
I will be uh, addressing uh, my remarks will be about the important provisions of the Lady Crapo Bill that strengthen the Violence Against Women Act. As a representative of the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, I urge the Senate to authorize the bipartisan, and I emphasize bipartisan, Lady Crapo Bill because it offers significant improvements over current statute. Allow me to elaborate on three sets of provisions. First, the Lady Grateful Bill streamlines and consolidates programs. It improves those programs that work and eliminates those that don't, which in this economic climate is a critical concern for advocates and legislators alike as Ben pointed out, the importance of, uh, and Cindy too, the importance of running uh, is uh, managing and administering federal grants is very, uh, it, it is very streamlined. The Lady Grateful Bill repeals 12 programs from the Violence Against Women Act of 2005, therefore making Wawa efficient. It consolidates 10 programs into three, therefore reducing duplication. It formalizes accountability provisions by statute, therefore preventing fraud, waste, and abuse. And it reduces the annual authorization funding levels by $166 million, approximately a 20% reduction on average. Therefore, it saves money. As an example, uh, I uh, offer the Title V, which is on healthcare, which consolidates three programs into one and reflects, again, more than a 20% cut in the amount authorized. The second set of provisions I want to emphasize in the Lady Crapo Bill is the one that reinforces and strengthens services and prevention for all groups of victims, be they elders, lesbian, gay, bi, and transsexual, individuals, immigrants, youth, native women, victims in faith communities, rural locations, etc. This is in keeping with the trajectory of the Violence Against Women Act, which has historically addressed very specific solutions to reflect the differentiated needs of victims and the recognition of victimized multiple forms of victimization. Let me offer two illustrative examples. The first example in Wawa 2005 was extending protections on victims to all four crimes that are currently in the statute, domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking. The second example is inserting a non-exclusivity clause that prohibits discrimination against and affords benefits and services to male victims, a demographic that includes both straight and gay men. The Lady Grateful Bill affirms the principle of services for all and the principle of non-discrimination. For example, regarding LGBT victims who, in fact, experience violence, domestic violence at the same rate as any other community, i.e. 25 to 33 percent, but they face far more discrimination and severe barriers. For example, 96 percent of victim service providers and law enforcement agencies said that they did not have services for LGBT victims. The Lady Crapo Bill clarifies that states would not be mandated to serve specific victim groups. However, the bill's language permits the states to do so. On the matter of prevention, the Lady Crapo uh, the, the, uh, Bill in Title IV consolidates programs on children exposed uh, to violence and engaging men and boys and as key dating violence prevention programs. The Chairman's Bill also includes numerous <coughs> areas for staff, and up to 5% of staff dollars may now be dedicated to prevention and education at the discretion of the states. The third set of provisions that I want to emphasize are those that address um, services for victims of sexual assault. The CDC's data, the, uh, referred to as NISPIS, the National Intimate Partner in Sexual Assault, Sur Sexual Violence Survey, uh, indeed uh, reinforces the need to strengthen services for victims of sexual assault. The facts are incontrovertible. 
1.3 million women were raped in 2009. One out of five women, one out of 71 men have been raped in their lifetimes. 80% of female victims are raped before the age of 25, and almost half experience their rape before the age of 18. 28% of male victims were raped when they were 10 years old or younger. The Lady Critical Bill would continue to support critical victim services, criminal justice responses, and prevention through ground programs such as the Sexual Assault Services Program, STOP, and Rape Prevention Education Program. It also goes further in addressing sexual assault more comprehensively, setting aside a portion of STOP monies uh, for initiatives by law enforcement and prosecutors to hold offenders accountable, to assist communities to establish sexual assault response teams, and to provide protections for victims of sexual assault residing in public housing. I conclude by emphasizing the bipartisan nature of the I'm sorry, bipartisanship of the Lady Critical Bill, thank <coughs> the senators for that impeccable leadership, and iterating the need for swift reauthorization. As one of the two champions of the bill, Senator Leahy summed it up precisely. I quote, this is a law that has saved countless lives, and it is an example of what can be accomplished when we work together. Hello, my name is Tanya Lovelace, director of the Norman Co. Network, and thank you for this opportunity to present today. As you've heard from my colleagues, domestic violence, sexual violence, dating violence, and stalking are a national crisis impacting our communities. However, the severity of violence is often heightened for those on margins. Those populations that are often underserved due to language, age, religion, and spirituality, geographic location, sexual orientation, and racial, cultural, and tribal barriers. As director of a member organization serving communities of color and other marginalized populations since 1997, the Women of Color Network, which is a project of the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, I've heard from countless advocates across the country that describe obstacles these victims face in accessing services. There are community-based, population-specific organizations that reach these victims. However, they're often dealing with limited staff and lack of adequate funding and resources to meet the need. The Lady Crapel Bill provides greater access and offers more gateways to services to underserved populations by offering an, an improved grant program enhanced to build the capacity of these programs and other landmark measures such as strengthening such as strengthened tribal provisions that will further improve access to Native women. There are many challenges across marginalized communities. For women of color, disproportionate, disproportionately high rates of poverty, limited education and job resources, language barriers, and fear of deportation increase their difficulty accessing help and support services. There is often limited or no transportation to needed assistance, especially for those living in rural areas. Many are unable to pay for violent fees and delayed law enforcement response is a common dilemma that, they, that many face within their communities. For tribal populations, the shortage of appropriate resources adversely effect, affects the availability of advocacy and support services for women and children who experience violence. Women with disabilities have 40% greater risk of violence than women without disabilities. They may be extremely isolated, only having access to their abuser, and they lack the use of a phone or the ability to reach out to people to ask for help. For victims experiencing violence in later life, they often do not seek help because they are embarrassed or scared, and they feel that they have no alternative but to endure the violence. For youth and young adult victims, many do not identify what is happening to them as dating violence or abuse. A teen may receive hundreds of text messages checking on their whereabouts and may not understand this to be a warning sign. There is even further concern for those victims and survivors that experience multiple barriers all at once and are, for example, persons of color who also have disabilities or are immigrants above 50 with limited language access. But these unique challenges, reluctance to seek support, and few gateways to services, the first place that many victims look for assistance are within those programs right in their neighborhoods, such as youth centers, senior centers, 
immigrant and cultural organizations or vocational organizations that are easy to reach, that understand their experiences and are designed to serve these communities. <laughs> Many of these programs have a track record for serving victims of violence, but need the opportunity to plan and strengthen their services, to implement improved and enhanced assistance, and to evaluate their progress. Underserved populations have been addressed in violence since 1994. However, the existing restructured grants for outreach and services program proposed in the Lady Crable Bill offers an enhanced gateway for these programs by providing the needed resources to strengthen their services. This grant program will also continue to allow for public education to raise awareness about domestic, sexual, dating violence, and stalking within communities and neighborhoods that often get under overlooked in receiving such information. Of particular note, American Indian and Alaska Native women are battered, raped, and stalked at greater rates than other women in the United States. Bible 2005 included a title specifically dedicated to addressing this these epidemic rates of violence, which is Title IX, the Safety for Indian Women title. The Lady Crable Bill contains tribal-specific amendments that will improve Title IX and enhance the safety of Native women by increasing access to culturally appropriate victim services and programs that will hold perpetrators accountable. Bible 2005 also further supports communities of color through improved culturally specific, specific provisions, which are critically needed to ensure that local communities have access to services that provide culturally and linguistically appropriate community-based interventions. As I wrap up my remarks, two programs stand out for me as critical reasons why the Lady Crable Bill will make a difference. The first program I'm reminded of is a Pennsylvania-based immigrant and refugee program. This organization has provided a cultural network for international women and their children for over 10 years, along with Story Circle and other innovative approaches to sharing their voices and exchanging common experiences. They also have provided much needed leadership and advocacy within the courts on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, improving language access and use of interpreters. In addition, they have provided crisis intervention to individuals needing new visas, child custody assistance, advocacy in domestic violence cases and sexual assault cases, and have served as a strong resource to programs across the state. This organization, though, is not currently tapped into federal assistance and would greatly benefit from the Grants to Underserved Populations Program and the Lady Crable Bill. Another program that comes to mind is within a Ohio church. This place of worship has a strong women's ministry that has stepped up to provide crisis intervention, outreach, for advocacy and shelter in specific cases to women and children who are unsafe. This church realizes that many of these women are unlikely to go to mainstream shelter for help and understand that they need immediate access to safety and support. They also have done some work to educate parishioners and clergy about violence. The Lady Crable Bill will provide this church the opportunity to apply for implementation funds to build the capacity for their services and for public education funds to broaden their efforts. In order to save lives, we have to be willing to reach out to the margins to support those less likely to access services. The Lady Crable Bill contains, contains features to ensure that these communities are reached. We urge the sponsors of this bill to do what they can to address the economic needs and access challenges of all underserved survivors of violence and to provide this much needed gateway to safety. Thank you. Well, I can't tell you how humbled and honored I am to be among such distinguished colleagues and passionate advocates to end violence against all women and all people. Um, the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence is the voice of the 56 state and territorial sexual assault coalitions and through them represent over 1,300 rape crisis centers that provide a frontline response to victims of sexual assault. And as you've heard today, Sexual assault advocates across the country are really, really excited about Senate Bill 1925. Um, you know, we feel that through all of the tragic stories that have come to light this year, we've, we've known about those stories in our hearts and from the stories we hear from survivors, but they're really coming to light in the media and in a big way. Um, but we really believe our nation is ready to truly address the issue of sexual violence in a broad and comprehensive way, and that 
this reauthorization of the Bonds Campus for the Women Act gives us some very important tools to do that. Um, so we are um, very excited about that. Um, I want to tell you that one of the outstanding aspects of this reauthorization of VAWA is the extent to which advocates um, and victims from across the nation have been involved in the process. Over two years ago, more than 2,000 advocates responded to surveys and national conference calls to name the most pressing issues facing victims. 22 issue committees formed out of those um, initial, uh, that initial input and um, convened to work through the responses and prioritize the most important issues for victims from all walks of life. And this extensive <coughs> input is what really provided the foundation for Senate Bill 1925. So we are so incredibly grateful to Senator Leahy and Senator Crapo for introducing such an outstanding uh, piece of legislation. We are incredibly grateful to our 25 co-sponsors. Um, we really wish Senator Kirk, um, one of our early co-sponsors, a very speedy and complete recovery. Um, we're also grateful to senators who have taken a leading role in particular aspects of LAWA. Um, Senators Hagan and Kirkin have taken a leadership role on the health title of VAWA. Senator Whitehouse has taken a leadership role in the youth and prevention aspects of VAWA. Senator Akaka has really stepped forward um, on the Save Native Women Act and some of the tribal issues um, in VAWA. And Senator Franken has taken a leading role in some improvements around the housing provisions and the housing title in VAWA. We're very excited that this VAWA expands protections for victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, and stalking to all public housing programs, including um, helping them transfer if they need to for safety reasons. Um, so we're very excited about that, both the sexual assault advocates and domestic violence advocates. Um, I'm going to turn it over in just a second for um, questions. We have a number of people in the audience that can help. I want to say thank you so much to the staffers that are here. Um, thank you for the meetings that you've had with us, the great discussions that we've had about while we work really look forward to continuing to work with you. You've heard that this reauthorization of VAWA is reasonable, cost-effective, streamlined and accountable. You've heard how we cut authorizations, repealed and consolidated programs, um, and that we really welcome and need the partnership of the federal government for those of us out in the field doing this hard work to help support our work. Um, we fully welcome your participation, um, and we want to just impress upon you the urgency with, we, which, with, with which we need to reauthorize VAWA. Um, VAWA has expired, um, and there are advocates across the country who are providing children and out of women, who are going to emergency rooms with rape victims, who are answering hotlines for young people, and they are worried. Um, we know that authorization, that the appropriations are in place for now, but what they are asking us to tell you is to please swiftly reauthorize LALA so that we can depend on our partner to make sure that we can do the work that we need to do to add violence against women. 